there's more data than ever before, right? There is an exponential growth of data. However, our ability to extract insights from said data has only increased marginally. Like I haven't heard very, CM, very many CMOs say, my marketing is killing now because of this big data. Hi, this is Andy North with Velocitize. Our guest today is Marcus Collins, Senior Vice President of Social Engagement with Donor Advertising. Marcus, thank you for being here. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. In an era of so much noise, particularly mm -hmm. in marketing, how do we cut through the noise, particularly with digital marketing? I think it requires a very concrete understanding of digital and marketing. So, for instance, you know, when we ask people what digital is, you typically get a lot of abstractions, jargon, and buzzwords. Uh, but truth of the matter is digital, by definition, is technology that processes, generates, and stores data in the form of zeros and ones. Now, that's great. That's awesome. But if I told someone that's digital, go make some digital, they say I don't know what to do with that. Uh, but the thing that makes digital so powerful is the application. And the application of digital is that it facilitates the network, its patterns, its behaviors, its structures, taking these disparate things and bringing them together right, to create better experiences. Um, and the way we use digital, that is the, the facilitation of the network to cut through the clutter so the, to understand, well, what is the clutter? The clutter is people. And people are in networks. So the idea is that we use digital to help facilitate the network of people. And the way we cut through is by understanding the dynamics of the network, um, their beliefs, their patterns, their structures, the social norms, the unwritten rules of those people, and find a way for marketers, for brands to play a role in their lives beyond the value propositions that their products provide. Talk about the convergence of creativity, data, and culture, and how the three are intersecting and how they're disparate. I think it's the convergence of the three that becomes the vehicle for ideas to propagate from person to person to person. I mean, this is so powerful about the digital, the connected world that we live in, the hyper-connected world that we live in. You know, culture becomes the frame or the context by which we operate from day to day. The data helps provide historical evidence of what people do inside those cultures. The creativity, the content, the messages, the idea, the products become the currency from people inside those cultures, right? We tell people about a great movie, not because the movie was so great, but because when I tell you about this movie and you like it, you're like, Marcus knows me so well. It tightens the bonds of the network. So when those three come together, they kind of create a Voltron-like um, node that brings people closer together and helps marketers be a part of their lives beyond just the products. So your presentation here at South by Southwest yep. is emoticulture, how data and science create happiness. Talk a little bit about that. So it's a, it's a bit of a nebulous topic, uh, but essentially it's this. You know, there, the, the, the provocation is that marketers want to create emotional connections with consumers in an effort to build loyalty-based relationships that's going to drive commerce, right? We're always talking about we need, to make, we need to tell stories that connect with people on an emotional level. And considering there's more data than ever before, you think we, can, we would understand what emotions are right for what people or the best ways to tap into them. But the truth of the matter is we find ourselves in this data paradox where there's more data than ever before, right? There is an exponential growth of data. However, our ability to extract insights from said data has only increased marginally. Like, I haven't heard very, CM, very many CMOs say, my marketing is killing now because of this big data. That my marketing is working 20 times better than it was 20 years ago because of all this data. And it leads to this idea that we have all this data, we know all this information about, about people, yet we really don't really know people. It's like we confuse information for intimacy. We don't really know people. So if we are to really engage with folks, that is tap into their emotions, we first must understand who they are on a very human level and then apply that humanity in such a way to help relieve points of friction in their lives. It's when we understand the data, the historical evidence of their behavior, we can figure out where we actually can, um, can evoke emotion in such a way that drives a particular outcome. That's fascinating. <laughs> Actually, quite. I just was listening. I was lost in what you were saying. That was fantastic. Would your, if we go to your TED talk, would that be too much of a crossover? No. So the TED talk, I mean, it's sort of like a, I wouldn't say I'm, uh, I'm beating the same drum, but I'm beating the same drum. It's essentially this, that it's been said that good marketers see consumers as real life human beings, having all the dimensions and trappings that real human beings have. 
But the truth of the matter is that marketers don't know people that well. And why is that? Because we rely on, um, on some conventional tools that are blunt instruments to describe people. For instance, demography. We use demographics to describe people, their age, their race, their gender, household income, geography, um, education. And we use that instrument to describe people. Now, while those things may be accurate facts, they don't accurately describe who people are. Take, for instance, my demography. I'm 38 years old. I'm black, if you had noticed. Um, I'm from Detroit. Went to public schools my entire life. If a marketer saw that on the brief, they'd say, oh, he must walk like this, talk like this, buy these sort of things, hang out with these sort of people, because that's just what those kind of people do. Now, it sounds awful for me to say it out loud, but this is what marketers do all the time. We're targeting moms, right? Um, Deborah drives a minivan. Oh, Deborah's must have, must have kids, and their kids must play soccer, and they live in a suburb on a cul-de-sac because that's just what minivan drivers do. We have this mental schema of who people are, and it's just not accurate. Now, while we may say, okay, well, um, that's why we focus on psychographics instead. Now, psychographics do a far better job um, the demogra demography does describing people. However, psychographics only tell you what people do, not why they do it, which means we need a better way to describe them and um, some idea of causality of their behavior. Understanding people on an intimate level gets us there. And then the data becomes a way for us to better understand how we can, um, I'm gonna say intercept them, but how we can help relieve some points of frictions that they have so that we can make emotional connections. So it's kind of, um, uh, it's, I just keep remixing the same song, <laughs> you know, the same song is that we have to understand people until we get there. The marketing will be random until we get there. It will be unpredictable. Well, highly unpredictable what the marketing would do. We have to understand people and it requires understanding the historical evidence of their behavior, the data, and to be able to apply some causality based theory to that. So it's taken us over a hundred years to get where we are and still we're almost at a caveman level in some points with we have a ton of data but we're not able to apply it. What do you see occurring over the next three to five years that helps refine that? I mean that's the interesting part is that our brains are very much wired the way we were in our hunter-gatherer state at the very core, right? We, we have um, updated the OS but the hardware is still very much the same. So while we are, we're learning to evolve with the, the changing landscape that we interact with on a daily basis in modern times, we're still using the exact same hardware as before. So while we, we're learning more about people, we're not understanding the underlying physics of people. So when we think about the technologies that we adopt, technology changes very, very fast. I mean, it's very, 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 very fast. But people change very, 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 very slowly. So if we think about the three to five year time span of what technology is going to be able to do to help elevate what we do, the next evolution of what people do, <clears throat> it requires us understanding the very foundation of people. And the technology that's going to succeed are the ones that extend current behavior even further than it already is. And that is taking what we normally do and like pouring gasoline on it. There's a, 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 a very famed um, sociologist and psychologist, a guy by the name of, of Marshall McLuhan, who would say that, that technology only extends on human behavior, like the wheels extension of the foot, the glass extension of the eyes, closer extension of the skin. And the technologies that extend us further that way are the ones that get massively adopted, right? Facebook, the Facebooks of the world, but Facebook in particular, Facebook, and other information uh, technology, communication technologies extend what would normally be a rapidly decaying friendship, right? If you graduate from college 20 years ago, and you guys live in different states, if you weren't very, very, very um, uh, committed to keeping the friendship alive, the relationship would decay over time. What Facebook does is just softens that decay, extending behaviors that already exist. So the technologies that are gonna be the most prolific and the most profound are be the ones that extend the behaviors that already exist. So it sounds like you would posit that tomorrow's marketers should be sociologists and psychologists. Absolutely, I think that I, when I try to hire people, I look for people who have a background in the behavioral sciences, whether it's anthropology, social psychology, sociology, behavioral economics, because A, they're already thinking about how people are wired. Right, so they're using good causality-based theory around thinking about people, but most importantly, they are empathetic. 
they're like learning to adopt people's uh, perspective and be curious about the things that are in their world, walking a mile in their shoes, seeing the world through, through their, their lenses. And if marketers could be just a, a percent of that, if we just calibrate our approach just slightly, we'll get at far better results. So obviously we're no longer in the phase of uh, Mad Men advertising where yeah. it's purely a push strategy. Sure. And arguably we've almost gone beyond the poll strategy as well. It's somewhat of a blend. Yeah. How do those blend going forward, particularly in the digital realm? I mean, it's, I think it's a cultural driver. The idea is that, you know, we used to have a broadcaster who would say, this is what's great, go, right? And then that became more fragmented when uh, cable became prevalent in, in U.S. households. Now you had many broadcasters saying, this is this, go. Now that's become even more fragmented now that people or I wouldn't call them broadcasters, but people are empowered to go preach the gospel, which is what we've already been doing. Like we've been doing that since the beginning of time, spreading word of mouth. Those things now are just extended or expanded because of the technology. So it becomes more of a tension now because people have always trust people more than marketers, right? We trust strangers more than marketers. We look at, at uh, Amazon reviews to say whether this thing is good or not, for complete strangers more than we do marketers, right? So we've always relied on people. Now we have technology that helps extend the things that we already used to do. So I don't have to rely on the ad man to say, this is an awesome thing. When my friends say, this is dope, you gotta use it, I'm saying, I'm gonna trust those guys, which is why culture is such a powerful vehicle for marketers. We have to have creative, commerce, and culture if we're gonna do our jobs really, really well. Your bio mentions that you've worked on a variety of different brands, including Beyonce. Mm -hmm. How does a person become a brand and how do they own that brand? I think the person becomes a brand the exact same way that a brand becomes a brand, right? Like not all companies are brands, right? They don't invest in, um, in more than just being a product, right? With branding comes memory aid, a locus for emotion, um, and a premium that, that's associated with it. And essentially what brands are trying to do is to somewhat be human. They adopt human qualities. They create relationships with people, right? They, they evoke emotion like people normally do. They become a brand mark, a trust mark. People are the exact same way. So it's far easier for a person to be a brand as long as they embody all the things that trust is associated with, right? They walk the talk, there's conviction, and everything they do is a demonstrative representation of that. You know, think about Beyonce as a brand, though she's an artist and she's a human being, you know, she has been preaching the gospel of her conviction since her Destiny Child days, which is about women empowerment. Now, while that may have evolved over time because she as an individual has evolved over time, much like Apple when Steve Jobs started, all about challenging the conventional norm, bucking the status quo, and the way they have done that has evolved over time as well. But the Apple mark is a trust mark, much like the Beyonce name and brand is a trust mark. So the same, the same principles um, are, are at play whether you are a entity or a person because at the end of the day, biologically, trust is trust. The same way we trust people or the same way we trust brands, the same way we trust technology. And therefore, the biology of how we interact with that as marketers is consistent regardless of what entity we are. Whether we're an artist, clergyman, um, a candidate, or a brand. Our guest today has been Marcus Collins, Senior Vice President of Social Engagement at Donor Advertising. Marcus, thank you so much for being here. Pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me.